segment of the show for today. The topic is patterns of African-American migration in the United States. And we're talking to uh, Dr. David Padgett, who is a geographer at Tennessee State University. <clears throat> and of course, Dr. Padgett, before we had our first commercial break, we were talking about some of the patterns of African-American migration. And you indicated that primarily it was a movement from uh, the South toward the West. But now, what I'd like to talk about uh, during this segment uh, is what is generally considered to be the great African-American migration, uh, that migration that occurred uh, between the census reports of 1910, 1920, and et cetera. Let's talk about it from that perspective. Let's have you to give us some information about this great migration. Okay, yes, indeed. Yes, certainly the um, great migration, of course, is the one that we're most familiar with historically, where uh, mass numbers of blacks left the South in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, now, there were some push factors mm -hmm. that differed somewhat from uh, those that pushed the exodusters out. Uh, there were a lot of natural disasters that occurred in the early part of the century. There were floods. Mm -hmm. Black people lived primarily in low-lying areas. Uh, there was the boll weevil mm -hmm. blight plague that wiped out cotton crops and put a lot of black mm -hmm. people out of work. Uh, and so that, along with the racism and the rise of the Klan and land theft and lynchings, uh, that was still there. That hadn't gone away. Mm -hmm. uh, those were push factors for pushing blacks out of the South. Um, and what was interesting was that still at that time, in the early part of the 20th century, 90% mm -hmm. of blacks lived in the South, mm -hmm. and 80% of that population lived in rural areas. Uh, so you had primarily a rural to urban migratory pattern where you had people from r rural areas going north, in this mm -hmm. case of the Great Migration, to mm -hmm. Chicago, to Detroit, mm -hmm. to Cleveland. In fact, uh, s the black populations of some of those cities, such as Chicago and Detroit, actually increased uh, two, three hundred percent mm -hmm. during that short period of time. And so the pull factors, what pulled black people to those cities, yeah. of course, were jobs, opportunities, more freedom, uh, probably mm -hmm. educational opportunities, all mm -hmm. these things that they were not getting mm -hmm. uh, in the South. Mm -hmm. And so this was a, a uh, significant mm -hmm. movement, mass movement of black mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Now, what impact did this have on uh, the northern parts of the United States? Uh, I think you indicated that uh, all of these uh, African Americans, 90% uh, are in the South, uh, either Southwest and et cetera, but all of a sudden, uh, within a 10-year period, they started uh, uh, appearing in Detroit and in Chicago, a uh, 200% uh, increase, and et cetera. How did the people in uh, many of these areas, black and white, feel in reference to uh, all these African Americans coming to uh, these cities? Well, in some cases, there was, of course, resistance by the white community. There was some uh, vagrancy laws passed. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of blacks did not get a job upon arrival in some of these cities, so mm -hmm. they would end up out of work for mm -hmm. periods of time. So you had these vagrancy laws where mm -hmm. blacks would be jailed for being unemployed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, or vagrants, mm -hmm. um, and so that was one reaction. Uh, what's interesting, as I saw in the uh, Smithsonian Institution exhibit on the Great Migration, mm -hmm. is that there was also resistance amongst northern blacks mm -hmm. who saw themselves as being more refined and being uh, mm -hmm. or higher, higher class mm -hmm. uh, than these uh, Negroes from the South. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some types of behaviors or, or, or things that blacks in the South commonly did that were frowned upon by mm -hmm. northern blacks, mm -hmm. such as sitting out on the porch braiding uh, a girl's hair. That was seen mm -hmm. as being uncouth or, mm -hmm. or, or, or talking loud. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if a lot mm -hmm. of the um, parts of that exhibit in the Smithsonian Institution had old documents that northern blacks would hand the southern blacks uh, about etiquette how to act in public. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really interesting. Uh, I never thought that that would happen, but mm -hmm. there was both there was white resistance and somewhat of mm -hmm. black resistance mm -hmm. to these um, mm -hmm. newcomers mm -hmm. from the South. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, we've often heard it said, uh, Dr. Padgett, that uh, many African Americans who were already in the northern parts of the United States, uh, who represented a very, very small percentage of the population, really felt that they did not have a problem relating to the uh, white population. Uh, but once these blacks from the uh, southern parts of the United States uh, the many and the uncouth and et cetera, not only did it create a problem for the Southern African Americans, but it also created a problem for the Northern African Americans too. And so they, therefore, they sort of resisted and resented uh, some of these newly arrived. And, and, and I think, uh, as you can probably uh, testify, that the same thing probably happened to the new immigrants mm 
uh, when we talk about uh, the 1890s when all of these immigrants came from southern and eastern Europe, and it, would you say that perhaps uh, the African American situation from north to south might have been comparable to the southern eastern European situation coming to uh, the United States? Would you see any kind of comparison in that as, ge as a geographer? Yeah, perhaps as a to some degree, but in many cases, on the family level, I don't think there was resistance because it was actually family members who were mm -hmm. calling down mm -hmm. south saying, look, mm -hmm. come on up here. You know, mm -hmm. there's opportunities. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, and I'm pr pretty sure the same thing was happening with Europeans, mm -hmm. that there were Europeans who had come here who mm -hmm. said, call their cousins or whomever back home mm -hmm. and said, come on, come on over. But I, I think you probably had a small portion of mm -hmm. the established black mm -hmm. elite mm -hmm. who offered resistance, but it wasn't resistance to the point that they were causing harm mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that was unlike the vagrancy laws and other laws that were passed mm -hmm. to crack down on the um, expl exploding mm -hmm. black mm -hmm. populations. Too many, in other words, there were too many African Americans as far as the lawmakers were concerned, and of course, uh, as far as their own uh, members of their race was concerned, that they were, they, not only were there too many of them, they were bringing too many bad habits uh, from the southern parts of the United States that was not a, necessarily approved. Uh, by uh, African Americans in uh, the North. Uh, and of course, Dr. Padgett, I think that in a real sense, uh, you came to us earlier and talked about these uh, kinds of trends that uh, occurred. Now, after the uh, Great Migration, what's the status of the African American population in terms of its movement after that? Uh, do they stabilize or whatever during this period? Well, the, the Great Migration moved forward until, of course, the Depression. And the Depression obviously slowed things down quite a bit. Uh, however, the Second World War uh, brought forth uh, a second movement as the boom times after the war uh, ex resulted in an expansion of the secondary or manufacturing economy. Uh, right after the Second World War, 99% of all the cars made in the world were made in Michigan, that one state. So, so there were lots of opportunities in the steel mills for African Americans with little formal education to come up and work with their hands and make a good living. Mm -hmm. And so it was the industry that uh, helped propel and helped to sustain, in a real sense, members of this uh, great migration, that after they got there, there was something for them to do after they became adjusted and whatever. Very good. And of course, Dr. Patrick, we're getting ready for this uh, second commercial break, after which we'll come back and we'll give you an opportunity to uh, talk about some of the recent trends uh, dealing with this African-American population. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short uh, commercial break. <laughs> 